Hello listeners, Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Before we dive into this episode, I have a few announcements for you. We hope you were able to join us last month for the second edition of the Dr. GPCR Summit. It was a great week filled with amazing talks from amazing speakers from all around the world, including early career scientists. Find out more about the winners of the best talks given at the summit by the next generation of GPCR scientists by following us on social media today. Also, you can now watch the talks from the summit on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe today. You will get notified whenever we share new videos, and it is also a great way to support our work. Another great way to support us is by subscribing to the Dr. GPCR newsletter. The upcoming newsletter contains the summit survey. We want to hear from you. Tell us what you'd want us to keep, improve, and how to make Dr. GPCR work for you. Stay tuned for the upcoming Dr. GPCR virtual cafe events. Visit drgpcr.com to find out more about all our activities. And now, let's dive into this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina for another episode of the Dr. GPCR podcast. Today, I have a great pleasure of having Dr. Mark Connor with me. He is currently, well, he is in Australia, so it's 7 p.m. Boston time, and it is, I believe, 9 a.m. Friday, the next day in Australia. Hi, Mark. Yep. Hi, Yamina. It's Lovely so to great meet to you. Thank you. Lovely to meet you as well. It's so great to have you on, on the podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. So you're in Australia. Tell us a little bit about, about yourself and about the, uh, the work that you do. So I work at um, Macquarie University here in Sydney. Um, I'm the professor of pharmacology, which is a little bit of a joke as there's only my lab doing pharmacology at our university. Um, so when I'm in the lab, uh, what we're trying to do is understand signaling of opioid and cannabinoid receptors and also I guess understand what ligands for those receptors might be doing at other targets so I've never really been someone who just looked at G protein coupled receptors and I think some of the more interesting things that are happening in the lab are around the actions of cannabinoids in particular uh, outside their activities at CB1 and CB2 uh, but being a comprehensive academic. Um, unfortunately, I do lots of other things. Uh, so I'm the Associate Dean for High Degree Research. So I look after the 400 or so graduate students in our faculty um, on the university's human ethics committee uh, and do a little bit of teaching as well. So unfortunately, there's not a, enough time to get everything done that I want to get done in the lab. Uh, but, you know, I but get some done. Which is a fantastic. You mentioned that you're you're the only pharmacology lab at the university. How yes. did that happen? Um, well, they didn't have any, and then they asked me to come over. Um, I think <laughs> so. We, Macquarie is a relatively new university, so that's about fifty years old, and our faculty of medicine is very new. It's only five or six years old, so it doesn't really have a department structure the same way that more that older universities have. So I was in the Department of Biomedical Sciences and that, you know, has me as a pharmacologist. It has a lot of people researching MND. It has people, so physiologists doing cardiovascular control, people looking at melanoma. So there's no, it, there aren't really disciplinary-based departments at the university or at least in our faculty. They're more collections of people who are in the same general area of research. So, yeah, basic biomedical science. Um, it's an interesting. Please go ahead. Yeah, and so um, yeah, there are yeah, traditional universities at Sydney, University of Sydney, University of New South Wales. They have pharmacology departments, and well, until recently, they did. They've got rid of those as well. They're sort of merging them into disciplinary based streams. You know, university administrators like to be seen to be doing things, and so certainly in Australia, they've been reluctant to leave structures which have probably worked pretty well um, by themselves. Yeah, leave them alone. They won't leave them alone. It's an interesting uh, structure. Rockefeller University is very unique. It's also a unique place where actually there aren't any departments where there is different labs and each lab has their, they have their own 
project, they have their own research area of interest, but there aren't any specific departments. So I guess it's a little bit similar to that. Yeah. And in Australia, you know, a lot of our academic traditions come down from the UK, but the professor tradition is not the same. When I was a student, you know, each department had a professor and who, who ran the department and Pharmacology had two because it was a clinical pharmacology professor as well as a pharmacology professor. But now professor is is a title and something you get promoted into based on your work. It's not it it doesn't sit within the structure. Yeah, there's no particular yeah. meaning to it within the structure of the university. So be, before becoming a professor of pharmacology, where where what did where did you study and how did you get interested in cannabinoids? Um, so I started at doing an undergraduate degree at Sydney University and I spent a lot of time there not studying. Um, <laughs> I guess I'd, and even at the end of my first year, I'd done so little study that I actually wanted to switch to an arts degree because um, I was also very interested in history uh, at high school as well as science. And um, I'd paid so little attention they didn't let me switch. So I had to, you know, keep redoing science subjects until I got my degree. And drugs had always been interesting. I don't think, and this probably dates me, the idea of G-protein coupled receptors hadn't really penetrated to Australia when I was an undergraduate. Certainly um, I learned a lot about them when I subsequently moved to the US uh, to do my PhD at the University of Washington, uh, which was yeah, serendipity. I had a friend who was going to go to MIT to study math and he was, you know, very smart and he sort of had worked out all the things you needed to do to get to the US and I just followed in his footsteps and, you know, sat the graduate record exam or whatever it is and um, wrote off to a bunch of universities saying, you know, are, are you interested in having me? And for their sins, University of Washington said yes. So I went over there and did a PhD uh, with Charlie Chavkin. Um, again, not on G-protein coupled receptors. I was working on the Sigma receptor, which at the time was a binding protein with that bound lots of interesting drugs that um, we now know are GPCR ligands. So I was binding haloperidol and psychotomimetic opioids and PCP and all kinds of things. Um, and I tried to purify an endogenous ligand for that. Um, in my PhD, and did a bit of electrophysiology and a lot of sort of biochemical type stuff. Um, and then after that, I went, I'd so I'd, I did a rotation in Neil Nathanson's lab there. So I did a little bit of GPCR stuff, looking at internalization, probably in 1989, looking at changes in receptor stuff on the receptor cell surface, muscarinic receptors. And I moved to Bristol to work with Graham Henderson, who had uh, been working with uh, John Hughes and Hans Kostelitz in his PhD, and he was involved in developing the bioassays um, that led to the isolation of the enkephalins. Uh, but again, I went there not to work on G-protein coupled receptors. Um, it was to work on signalling of, I think, an epidermal growth factor receptor to probably what turned out to be receptor-operated calcium channels, um, but we could I couldn't ever make that work. So I ended up sort of as a backup starting to look at uh, bradykinin receptor signaling and opioid receptor signaling. So that's when I first sort of started doing research on G-protein-coupled receptors, even though I'd always been interested in, you know, I worked in Charlie's lab because he did opioids, and opioids are very interesting. Um, but it turned out that what I was doing in his lab was nothing to do with, um, you know, G-protein coupled receptors. Yeah. Um, I even did, you know, GTPA's activity assays, um, the old-fashioned way, looking at hydrolysis of, you know, radio-labeled GTP and, yeah. you know, activation of the sigma receptor did nothing. Uh, so it wasn't wasn't a G-protein coupled receptor, as we now know. Um, so I did G-protein coupled receptor work in, Char in Graham's lab, Came back to Australia to work with Matt Christie, doing sort of half the time looking at the nociceptin receptor and opioid tolerance at the mu receptor, and then the other half of the time looking at the effects of uh, 
insect oh, spider venoms on ion channels, insect ion channels and mammalian ion channels. So kind of splitting between the two and then finally landing with G-protein couple receptors for good um, when I started um, yeah, my own independent group looking at opioid receptors in sensory neurons and it sort of went from there. I mean, cannabinoids, I remember when I finished my PhD work in Charlie's lab and I had about three months while, you know, sort of wrapped up the formalities of, you know, writing the thesis and doing the defence. And he said, well, what would you really like to do in these next few months? You could do anything you want. And at that point, people were just starting to think about, so this is the early 1990s, people were thinking about cannabinoid receptors and a few ligands had become available. And so what we thought might be interesting was to try and look for endogenous cannabinoids using this same approach that I'd done to look for endogenous sigma ligands, but nothing ever came of it. Uh, you know, it was a couple of months. Yeah. Uh, and so I first ran into cannabinoid stuff while working with Mac because he was partnering with uh, Ian McGregor, who's a, a very prominent cannabinoid biologist and Ian's a psychologist and didn't really understand molecular pharmacology and kind of figured that really all we were interested in was looking at bits of twitching vas deferens. Um, but nevertheless, he thought we could be useful to, and he, yeah, to, to look at the actions of some of these cannabinoid drugs. He, he got a hold of some SR141 very early on, so the uh, Ramonabant antagonist from Sanofi, and we started putting it into brain slices and looking at cannabinoid actions in brain slices, uh, which was mostly the work of others, Chris Vaughan in the lab. Uh, and then I sort of kept going back to them uh, while mostly studying opioids. And I guess discovered that THC, uh, the, you know, the CB1 agonist from cannabis, uh, was quite a powerful modulator of T-type calcium channels. And so that kind of kept bubbling away. Uh, and then uh, some chemists from Sydney Uni who'd got interested in novel psychoactive substances um, were synthesising a whole bunch of synthetic cannabinoids that had been showing up illicitly or showing up in unregulated markets and said, well, we don't know what these do. Can you tell us whether they're a CB1 or CB2 agonist? And I said, well, yeah, I can. Um, and I did, and off we went. So we've sort of looked at hundreds of those since then. And then at Sydney University, a phil philanthropist slash entrepreneur called um, Mr Lambert gave $30 million to Ian McGregor and the university to, to look at medicinal cannabis, uh, Barry Lambert. So, you know, they started making available lots of phytocannabinoids and we've kind of taken it from there to look at, at their actions at GPCRs and other other targets. So, that's that's a very such a, answer. That's okay, yeah, but I, I, I'll i take you a little bit, uh, I'll take yeah. you a step back. So based yeah. on, on what I understand is that you really, so we went from Australia to the US and then you went, you went to Ireland um, and, then, and then came back. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not Ireland. Uh, England. England, yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and then came back to to Australia, and you mentioned that to you you initially went into the U, to the US because one of your friends who got a position uh, as a postdoc at MIT, and you thought, what? Why not try and go into a PhD in the US? But yep. was there any other motivation to come to the US? Was it because you wanted to explore? Um, so deep back, um, I, I guess I'd always thought of going to the US as a possibility because my father's older sister um, studied chemistry in Australia in the late 1940s, and she was a very smart and a very groundbreaking woman, still is. Uh, she couldn't do a PhD in Australia because they, she was interested in mass spectrometry, and, and we didn't do that in the late 1940s in Australia. So she ended up going to the US and doing a PhD, um, I think, at Michigan State, uh, and ended up working uh, at NYU uh, and Rutgers, and eventually she ended up being um, 
the person in charge of quality control for Roche in the US and wow. was, I think, the first woman on the UPS. So the the US pharma, um, you know, pharma capia. Wow. So I, I knew that that was a possibility and um, I had actually lived in Canada uh, for two years as a child. Father was in the army and mm-hmm. we spent two years in Ottawa. So I, you're kind of familiar a bit with North America. Um, and I felt it was time to get out of Sydney for a while for various reasons. Um, and so I sort of took the opportunity Um I'm not sure I seriously thought it was going to happen until I got the letter from the UW saying, yeah, we're happy to have you. Um, but it, it did happen. So, yeah, it was it was exploring um, somewhere different. Um, it was hard to, well, not about hard to get out of Australia. I couldn't really see any other way. It's not that I wanted to leave Australia particularly because I didn't like being here, but it was an opportunity for a bit of an adventure. And, you know, when I'd finished in Seattle, I probably wasn't quite ready to come back to Australia. So that's why I went to England. Which is fantastic. The reason I bring, uh, I always ask these questions because I know that a lot of listeners are PhD students, master's students, or even postdocs. And it's very important to emphasize the fact that, you know, it's okay to want to explore and it's okay to leave your country or leave your city or you know, I think you should follow your your gut, follow the science, and I think you're a great example of that. I mean, life has to be interesting, right? And, <laughs> you know, my life may not be particularly interesting sitting here in my living room, you know, for eight weeks or whatever it is we're doing at the moment. Um, but, yeah, you've science offers you opportunities that yeah. are not always there. Um, in other fields of life and certainly weren't there 30 years ago um, to just go off and, and do stuff. And I guess it was also something that was a bit of a an Australian thing to do. Young Australians like to leave for a while. We are a long way from other countries and certainly even more so then. And so, you know, the idea of getting out and seeing a bit of the world is a very appealing one and lots of, lots of young Australians did that and still do it. That's great. You mentioned that you you had uh, written letters to different labs in the US. Uh, these are literal letter letters on oh, paper yeah. that you you mailed. Of course, um, I I am. Yeah, and you know all my yeah you know, so, somewhere you know my parents and you know ex girlfriends and things have boxes of letters that we wrote each other um, over that whole time. Um, Certainly, certainly couldn't afford to be calling anyone, and there was certainly no email. Um, you know, I remember, you know, I still used to, you know, things like, um, well, you know, we had things like current contents and, you know, the citation indexes, which were actual books. There was no med, there was medline was something you booked and did once or twice in your PhD. It wasn't, yeah, yeah the, the the ways of communicating we take for granted now were not available. Um, which, you know, adds, I mean, communication is great, but it also did make you more self-reliant because, you know, you were there starting something on your own and you weren't, you know, you couldn't just call people up or, <laughs> or you know, tweet at the- meeting or whatever. Yeah, it was just, it was, you know, you had to make your friends in the new, in the new place because you were, yeah. were there 100%. So let, let's take a, a further step back. You mentioned that in your during your undergraduate graduate uh, when you were getting your undergraduate degree, you were decide trying to decide between switching to to arts and you loved history as well. And where did your your uh, your love for science come from? Let let let's go to to and ask Mark at fifteen. Yeah, you know, did Mark um, at fifteen like like science? Yes, he did. Well, he liked. He liked astronomy um, very much, and he read a lot of science fiction. Um, so yeah, I was I was interested in science. Um, I was interested in, I guess, some social you know social aspect of science, extrapolation of of science, and how um, 
how it might change the way we lived. Um, drugs were always interesting. Um, my mother was a pharmacist as, and, mm-hmm. you know, she had her old copies of the British Pharmacopoeia lying around and they were, you know, fascinating books of potions and, and various things. Um, but I also liked history and English. I like, you know, I love to read. Um, I loved being interested in in how people had lived, um, how similar and different differently people thought about things um, at different times during human history. And so, you know, for my high school certificate, which is our you know, matriculation from high school. I did, you know, two science subjects, neither of which were biology, uh, and two history subjects, and then um, English and maths. And so when I sort of got my results, it was like, okay, um, what am I going to do? I suppose, you know, I had no thoughts that I would have a research career. I probably didn't even know what that was. Um, Maybe I'll become a teacher. So if I was going to become a teacher, I could do teach history or teach science and I guess I figured if I'd really thought about it at all then perhaps there was more chance of getting a job as a science teacher Um, and I think also there was always the idea that in science is discovery you know it's, it's easy to see in science thinking about new things and discovering new things and while of course now I know that that happens all the time in history as well perhaps 30 or 40 years ago, history was a little bit more just recycling knowledge, which we figured we knew everything about it. And there was, yeah, this is this is what history was. And it seemed harder to see how you would get insight uh, by doing history. Now, of course, I now know that's, you know, rubbish, but um, back then it was harder to see where the excitement and the discovery would come. Um, you know, of new things rather than just reinterpreting what we apparently existing, what we already knew. That's that's so great. Did you, so you mentioned, you know, teaching, being a science teacher, well, you're somewhat there, you've, you're, you're the, you're doing it in some ways, um, not necessarily Um, um, in the typical, you know, high school science teacher but you're, yeah. you're you're teaching science in some ways yeah and i don't know whether i would have been a very good high school science teacher i'm not sure i have the discipline to to be doing that um i hope yeah through undergraduate teaching and, and teaching um phd students that i am you know getting across my excitement about science but also getting across you know important ideas about how we should be doing it and thinking about it. Um, But I I guess, again, because I've spent most of my time doing research, I've never really had the need to uh, do a lot of the the skill development that a lot of university, you know, very good university lecturers um, do and the whole pedagogy of learning is something that has kind of bypassed me uh, because I've either had, you know, my head in a microscope or um, or some administrative task or whatever. Um, but it, so, I think a lot of, a lot of scientists um, who, you know, are lab heads, they, they grow into the role of teaching. They hopefully grow into the role of, of directing uh, a team and having that team oftentimes, and that's something I feel like could be taught or could be scientists could be helped by universities on, on better understanding how to communicate to a larger audience, you know, pedagogy that you had mentioned, but also, you know, how to lead a team effectively. Yes, there are lots of things that you end up supposedly being able to do as you, you know, progress through your scientific career that you end up receiving no training for. So, yeah, you know, even managing accounts or um, HR stuff, all of those things you just sort of assumed, well, look at this training video and then you'll be able to do it. Um, yeah. it's, but It's not the case. No. Uh, but, you know, a lot of that comes from, and certainly particularly in universities, what we ask, you know, what, 
what we ask of scientists, um, you know, the whole progression from being someone who spends five or six days a week in the lab to someone who then spends a lot of their time managing things and, you know, ending up, you know, in a position like mine being the uh, Associate Dean for High Degree Research. Well, I mean, I think I do a reasonable job of that, but it's not what I enter, you know, it's not what I started out wanting to do. And I'm not sure I'm necessarily the best person to do it. Um, but, you know, I've been, well, I've either been successful enough or not successful enough at some of the other things I've been doing. So here, take this job. Um, we think you can do it. You're not bringing in enough grant money anyway to, you know, to be, um, to be in the lab full time. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's a difficult, um, yeah, it's a difficult transition. And I, I remember when I, so th this job at Macquarie is the first, um, so it's, you know, it's a tenured position. It's the first job I've had that wasn't based on, um, you know, getting grants to pay my salary. And I remember in, you know, this job came along at just the right time, but I remember as I was, you know, working on what would end up being the last grant that paid my salary, thinking that there's no way I'll be able to justify getting another one of these because I was spending my time, you know, I was chair of an animal ethics committee and supervising students and doing some lecturing and, and all of this other stuff when I was supposed to be spending all my time doing research, but um, I wasn't. And it seemed inescapable, you know, that transition from, from spending your time doing research to doing all this other stuff. Um, because you had apparently been reasonably good at research, so well, maybe you'd be good at all these other things as well. Yeah, I think I think there's nothing wrong with assuming that you'd be good at the, uh, these other things as well. But the, where the pro where I see the problem is uh, making that assumption and still um, requiring scientists to continue to perform to that level while doing yeah. 10 million other things. Yes. And then being told, well, you didn't have enough results, you didn't have enough publications, therefore no grants, therefore thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, to be fair, yeah, this, this sort of more recent administrative, yeah, this position that I've got, which takes up most of my time, is something that I chose to put my hand up for Yeah. because, yeah, sort of five or six years ago, uh, you know, I, well, I realised it's hardly a blinding revelation that, you know, funding for basic research in Australia is very much on the decline and it's very hard to get um, funds to, to do research in a university. I mean, it's not impossible, but the success rate for grants is about one in 10. And, you know, one grant round a year, being, being head of a small group, a little bit isolated in a university, I knew I had to do other things to... I guess, um, show my value to the university and hopefully um, keep my lab ticking over until, you know, we get a change of government and they start recognising the value of science again. So think, it was a little bit of a holding pattern. I think the, the grant uh, approval rates are, are not as, are, are low everywhere, including the US mm. and Canada. So I think everyone who's listening to this to the podcast yes. really understands the difficulties let's let's go back to science let's not talk yes, about let's, grants yeah, let's, let's yeah no. let's so gpcrs let's we can talk about you know other other projects that you're involved mm -hmm. in but um I, I asked this to for i ask all of my guests this question what is your favorite gpcr i kind of know the answer to that but still well, i'm gonna ask i don't know if you do because i'm not sure i have one Oh, okay. um, yeah, the, yeah, the mu opioid receptor was the first one that I spent a lot of time with um, and still do do some work on. And, you know, it's a very important and interesting one. Um, the nociceptin receptor, ORL1, yeah, was very good to me for a while. Um, and I think there's still a fair bit of work to be done understanding that. And, you know, CB1 and CB2 are also... Um, very interesting, and there's a lot of things that we need to do to understand them. So, I wouldn't really like to pick among among any of those um, receptors. They've all, you know, they've all been good to me. I hope I help people understand um, their function, and 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're all still potentially very interesting from, um, you know, drug development, um, et cetera. You know, I've got a lazy eye on the um, oxytocin receptor at the moment as well. So, you know, <laughs> you never know where we're going to head. <laughs> Um, I think I like I like GPCRs in general, and um, you know have worked on a relatively restricted number of them. Um, but yeah, they're all interesting. I think so too. I, I think I think all all yeah. GPCRs are interesting. Um, I, it, I, yeah, we could we could talk for hours about yeah. why they're interesting, and then we would agree through the whole conversation. Yeah. I was sure that you were going to say that CB1 is one of your favorite receptors. Um, but I, uh, I, I respect the, <laughs> exactly. <have> favorite children. <laughs> exactly. I think, I think that was one of my pre- our previous guests. I think it was, um, uh, the Dr. Gutkin uh, from UCSD who mm-hmm. said, and we were talking about G proteins and he said that it's difficult to, for him to choose a favorite G protein. He also has two kids and he can't choose his favorite child. So I think, uh, mm-hmm. Makes sense. Makes absolute sense. Yeah. So you mentioned that you're taking a look at the oxytocin receptor. Uh, what what are the questions that you're asking around this receptor? Well, I guess the oxytocin receptor. Um, the reason I've, I'm looking at that is, and not and so this is a collaboration, and it's it's relatively early days. But um, some colleagues of mine have synthesized some small molecule oxytocin agonists. And so, yeah, so there aren't really any of those around and people are still essentially snorting oxytocin and hoping that it's getting into the brain to do things. Um, and these these agonists should make that a bit of a thing of the past. Uh, and so we're essentially trying, again, if we can land some funding for this, to start doing all of the contemporary pharmacological things that you would do with these small molecules, it's likely that they're not going to engage the receptor the same way as the peptides do. So are they signalling efficiently through the same pathways? What's their efficacy compared to oxytocin or vasopressin activation of the receptor? Um, How are they going to act at the many uh, variants of the oxytocin receptor that exist, the single nucleotide polymorphisms and things? Um, So... What we're planning to do is is essentially throw, you know, ligand-directed signaling and allosteric and efficacy at oxytocin receptor, looking at these um, looking at these new molecules, and and I suppose that sort of highlights again something that I'm not necessarily a disease-focused person. I'm not driven by wanting to understand a particular condition um, or provide Um, a solution to necessarily any particular kind of problem. I'm interested in understanding how molecules interact. And by doing that, then, yes, hopefully providing insight into how drugs can be used to treat particular conditions. Um, I guess, you know, the two things that would be obvious that, you know, you would say that I've studied would be, you know, uh, opioid dependence, tolerance and dependence, and and pain relief. Um, You know, they're very complicated um, biophysiological processes and, you know, no one receptor is key to any of them and and pain in particular uh, is such a complex, complex phenomenon that, you know, fiddling around the margins of one particular receptor is not going to change um, change complex or chronic pain states. So I don't, I guess I've, I've given up pretending that it's going to. And so I just start, okay, how can, how can I, how can I do something that might be helpful um, in, you know, whatever contribution cannabinoid CB1 receptor activation can make to uh, ameliorating pain. Um so uh, it, it's it's so interesting because my next question regarding the oxytocin receptor work was going to be: Are there any diseases associated with oxytocin signaling? In my mind, to me, oxytocin is 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 love, as you yes, know, holding well, hold, um, hold, holding a newborn yeah, and, and getting and might, that connection. So I think people 
um, uh, can, you know, oxytocin might help people who are unable to make those kinds of social connections very easily. And, and that can, you know, the disruption of, of social connection can occur in all kinds of different situations, whether it's in neurodegenerative disorders, um, whether it's um, people who are in some way not neurotypical. Um, you know, there's certainly many, um, and, you know, I'm not a psychologist and I'm not pretending to understand uh, different classifications of, of um Disorders, but yeah, oxytocin is thought to have a pro-social effect, and so that can be applied potentially in many different situations. Um, I am sure that there are other reward-related um, things that oxytocin might be doing. Um, there's obviously lots of oxytocin involved in um, parturition, things like that. Um, other more acute bonding events, you know, there's lots of things that um, oxytocin might be interesting for. Um, and I think it's the other thing that's very interesting about the oxytocin system is that, you know, oxytocin and vasopressin receptors, their ligands, their endogenous ligands uh, are fairly promiscuous and, you know, they talk to each other. And I think this is another potentially interesting thing with the selective oxytocin uh, small molecules is that they seem to be at least at this stage, much better at activating oxytocin than vasopressin receptors. So they might also be tools to be pulling apart precisely what um, that receptor family does um, without, you know, without using knockouts or relying on antagonists, particularly. Yeah. So, I love I love the idea of you know picking specific receptors and really going to dig deep into what happens intracellularly when these receptors are activated. Um, the dream, yeah, my I, dream would be to have this map yep. where you, you can have all the receptors and then you can pick one receptor and look at the receptor ligand combination and be able to go downstream of, of the signaling and figure out what happens and what is the physiological outcome or the relevance. Yep. For all of the receptors. Yeah, but of course it'd be a very complicated map because they're all be talking to each other at the same time. Yes. Which I think is something that we don't appreciate. Um for a long time. We've been very even though we're putting drugs into whole animals in many cases, um we just think about, well, here's this drug and its receptor and and this activating this receptor or even this signaling pathway is, you know, making the animal do this which, of course, is, you know, rubbish. Uh, yes. And we, I don't think in general as a field, we've really grasped the idea of how to study receptors in the kind of um, molecular detail that we like to do in the context of all the other receptors, all the other stuff that's going on in a cell at the same time and all the other GPCRs or ion channels that are being uh, activated at the same time. Um as, as is happening in us at the moment. Uh, you know, we have cells in a dish, we put on one drug, measure a response, and that's great. But, you know, normally there'll be 10, 15, 20 other receptors activated at the same time. And yes. that integrated molecular map, I mean, that's, you know, a hell of a dream you've got. <laughs> that's the next, next, next level when it comes yeah. to that. I think already, already understanding at the receptor ligand pair or even G protein coupled with the receptor and that particular group of proteins together, what they do when, when activated, what happens in the cell is already fantastic and very interesting, but yes, putting all the puzzle pieces together to understand how does that affect the entire cell, the entire organ, the entire organism. I think that's, that's, that would be just beautiful having a tool where we can just, very easily um, go into the map in a 3D form and, and look at what happens when, you know, you push button one versus button 15. Yeah. Um, and I think we're some distance from that 
we, yes, we are. Yes, we are. Speaking of, of distance and really understanding uh, understanding receptor and, and receptor function, um, are there any tools or initiatives that you think we should uh, take into account in order to get to that point where we can get a better understanding in general of what happens when a drug is ingested in a human or in an animal at the receptor level? It's a loaded question. I, I know. Well, it's a lot. It's a it's a it's a complex question. I mean, we need to we need to un, we need to understand. Well, we need to understand how much of a drug is wherever it is. Okay, so when you know just pharmacokinetics, you know, we need to we need to understand. Um, yeah, if we're talking about synaptic transmission, okay, I take some morphine. How much morphine is going to be um, at my VTA synapse? Um, it's important. What else is going to be there? Some of our most interesting drugs, morphine, one THC in particular, are uh, low efficacy agonists. So what are they doing to the signaling of the endogenous agonists that are also going to be there? Um, because certainly with THC, I think they're going to be blocking endocannabinoid signaling on some level. Um, how does the signaling profile of THC differ from that of the endogenous agonists? Um, and, yeah, so putting all of these things into context and being able to understand how much of any of these things there are around is very important and, and very difficult to do. Uh, measuring, you know, the moment-to-moment -moment concentration of endogenous neurotransmitters is, is very difficult. I think the other thing that is people are starting to think about more but is what is the temporal what are the temporal characteristics of signaling how long do you know you whack morphine in well how long is it going to be inhibiting synaptic transmission uh, at that concentration that what adaptations are cells going to have to the continued presence of, of morphine and obviously this was a, a sort of a, a long running saga in the opioid field because um, tolerance is very important and we can measure cellular tolerance and the sort of we can measure consequences of withdrawal so adaptations um, but those things are often yeah they're obvious with opioids because you know we see people with substance use disorders and and the, you know the physiology is there in front of us but presumably the same thing are happening for other drugs in more subtle ways and Understanding what the adaptations in cells are to prolonged drug exposure is something that's really important. Um, you know, even if it's yeah, you know, even if it's not a drug with psychoactive properties, it's going to be changing changing the cells it's acting on um, if it's there for any length of time. I mean, how you understand that stuff is where smart people have got to come in and, and start thinking about it. But but we all need to be thinking about the context of of that um, and you know again thinking about complexity um, yeah I think an, an, un, an under-researched area of GPCR uh, work is looking at you know so uh, people with cancer and so they take you know we have chemotherapeutic drugs that that, yeah. that treat cancer but most of those people are going to be on a bunch of other medications, particularly older people, whether they're heart medication, whether they're pain medication, and how those GPCR interacting drugs are also interacting with the cancer or interacting with the immune system that's helping to clear the cancer is a very underexplored area, very complex, but I think something that sort of deserves a lot of attention. It is very complex, especially when it comes to, you know, not only the interaction with of the drugs within that human, but the cancer as well, the cancer treatment, but also the genetic background of that person yep. Yep. also matters. So, you know, taking X amount of morphine to, with, within might have a different um, response from person A to person B. Some oh, people... Sure. You never, you never, you never know, and I think that's well, that's that's very difficult. Um, and I know, for example, in my case, when it comes to to opiates, um, 
I have, I don't have any rashes develop, but the, my skin on my face itches and it's just the worst thing ever. Okay. That's not good at all. No, um, but it's, it's, it's yeah. not, it doesn't show. It's just very difficult to not to, not to yeah. touch my, my, my face. And I learned today, interestingly, that actually that secondary effect comes from another GPCR, which is involved in, in the itch um, feeling, but then it depends. I think, we have to take into consideration the interactions between the different drugs, the interactions within a certain disease, but also the, the human that all these compounds go into. Yeah, and the and the yeah the human experience because we yeah I think with yeah there are polymorphisms of the opioid receptor of the mu opioid receptor. Mm -hmm. I think the most convincing story is to how one of those might affect a response to morphine is that they have. A different methylation site uh, because of the SNP changes the methylation site, so it changes the stress dependent regulation of the mu receptor. Um, and so it's not even necessarily the response of the receptor when there's any exogenous agonist there. Um, you know, life history may determine how much you express in particular parts of the brain. And I mean, we can't throw up our hands and say it's too complicated, let's forget about it. But on the other hand, um, and, and obviously we can't immediately solve this problem, but we've, we've always got to have it in our mind and, and be thinking that, you know, what we're seeing in our hex cells or our ATT20s or whatever is part of the story um, and it's an important part of the story and it's not any less real for being in a hex cell, um, but it's not the whole story. And it's not. let's not make sweeping conclusions based on, on what we see in those cells. And, you know, hopefully that's something I've, well, I've tried to avoid, which is possibly why I'm not a full-time lab researcher. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's very important also to, yeah, not to, I think interpret, gathering the correct data with the right controls is very important. Obviously, I think everyone agrees on that, but I think also putting them into a context of a bigger question becomes important, but then also there is the last consideration is not to overblow the results yeah. that you have. It's important, exactly. it's part of the story, but you need to be aware that it's a story in hex cells, which gives us a clue to get to that next level of understanding. And we're talking about opioid receptors and um, you know, there is this, the, the side effects of, of taking long-term opioids. And there was this stories coming out saying, well, we want, uh, I can't remember exactly if we wanted G protein biased ligands versus beta restin biased ligands. What are your thoughts on? Um, <laughs> I was going to say, don't get me started on those stories. Um, <laughs> but it's almost come full circle now. Um, so yeah, I was doing, so when those stories, so when um, functional selectivity or, or, ligand-directed signaling or whatever you'd like to call it um, became a big thing in the opioid receptor area. I would, that was kind of what I was doing, uh, looking at tolerance, um, so treating animals with morphine and, and looking, dissociating neurons and then making electrophysiological recordings to see how the opioid signaling, had the mu receptor signaling had changed in those animals. Um, and, you know, there was, I, I guess... Uh, the lab I was in, so that was with Matt Christie and with the whole history that he had working with Alan North and um, and then other work that was going on in the lab um, with Chris Vaughan and Elena Bagley and, and such, it was clear that um, an important element of of this of, of chronic opioid use was adaptations. So you can sort of study what the receptor itself is doing um, and it was clear that even after treating animals with very high concentrations of opioids, the receptors continued to signal at a lower level than they were previously, but they continued to signal robustly. Um, whether they internalised or not didn't seem to make a difference because if you, you know, the the idea with internalisation was that, well, it would reduce tolerance because phosphorylation would be removed and the receptors would get recycled. So they could continue to signal and that continued signaling caused adaptations in the cells. Um, so I guess I always thought it probably didn't matter whether receptors were recycling or whatever, 
because if they continued to signal, then the adaptations which caused the problems would happen. Um, I can be quite a sceptical person. I wasn't entirely convinced by the papers showing the importance of or purporting to show the importance of arrest and knockouts yep. in opioid action, um, partly because they seem to ignore the fact that, yeah, there's, what, two arrestins that really function outside the retina, and they're going to be interacting with hundreds of GPCRs. And so knocking out one of those proteins is going to cause changes in all kinds of um, signalling pathways and neurons involved in opioid-sensitive circuits. And so, yes, it's going to have a direct effect on opioid signalling, but it'll have an effect on the signalling of the, the dozens of other things going on at the same time. Um, and so I, I guess I never really bought into the idea that, you know, arrestin was all bad and that G-proteins were necessarily all good um, because, you know, I always thought that G-proteins were driving adaptation. Um, and I think in the end now, by and large, that's the fields come round to realising that arrestin isn't some monster that, you know, I think one of the, one of the companies or well, the company that was driving the G-protein biased agonist, you know, in some of their review articles had this picture which basically had um, you know, the neuroceptor G-proteins doing all the good things and arrestin doing all the bad things like reward and respiratory depression and tolerance and dependence. And, and there was never any evidence for that. And, it, you know, it's just not true. Um, I think efficacy is probably more important. And, you know, I was on part of a large group that, that put out a paper on that, I think, last year. And so, of course, I would say that. Um, and I know Laura Bond yeah. says something different and she's, apparently reanalyzed the data in the paper uh, to come to a different conclusion. Um, I'm not sure what where we're sitting with what we think of that reanalysis. I, I mean, I'm not in a position to understand enough of the, the equations to necessarily yeah. know who's right or wrong on that one. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, it was one of those things that really distracted the field for a long time. Um, that, it, that, it, that it had to be, yeah, it was a big idea and it had to be one thing or the other, not something more nuanced. And yeah. I think now it's pretty much all blown over and we're back to um, perhaps looking at a more fundamental property of, of drugs, which is efficacy. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, lo I love I love the uh, the word nuanced and I think a lot of things are nuanced when it comes to, to the field and, and receptor signaling and that the the way they can the receptors control physiological functions is dependent on so many variables and all of these yeah. things happen at the same time and that is integrated directly so the receptor senses all those changes and the response the physiological response really depends of on on the the sum of all of those those yes. those inputs that happen yeah and I understand that people need, you know, it's part of how do you become a successful scientist to, to you know, have a lab that you're happy with and, and receive funding. You have to have a story. And, you know, I spent enough time in the US. Um, I ended up spending another couple of years um, in Oregon as a visiting scientist while my wife did a postdoc at the Volum. Um, and, you know, it's... Um, you need to sell your story and sell yourself. And, and you know, I saw uh, the PI, you know, I worked with uh, Ed McCleskey, who's more of an Iron Channel guy. And, you know, he spent, you know, a week, a month on the road telling his story, even though he was a very successful, incredibly smart guy, he still had to get out there and be a salesman. And I understand in those situations, stories can get simplified and 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 nuance is lost it's just unfortunate because it it can sort of lead people down down garden paths or or make people feel like something is is much simpler than it is
Yes, and I think I think the development of you know better tools to to better understand um, the physiological the the signaling effects of different compounds and being able to to integrate more data and analyze more data and put it in context, I think is is something that we definitely need in the field and. That that's coming up, you know. We you mentioned um, we talked in the beginning about writing letters and, and then mailing them, mm-hmm. and then making phone calls wasn't mm-hmm. an option. Well, not so long ago when I started out, we were measuring cyclic AMP using tritiated, um, hmm. well, use, using tritium, and and you had to you had to purify your cyclic AMP produced by the cells, and then there were two sets of columns, and you had to wash the columns and I- then put. I've, done, I've, I've got stuff from the abattoir to make the binding protein at one point um, just to try something out. Yeah, exactly. And and so you had an endpoint assay. Yes. Um, you know, yes. Yeah. And, and, and now, now you can, we can do it in real time. Exactly. Which I think what, is what, really important. It is. It is. And I think that's we're going into that direction where we can acquire more data, faster, of better quality, and using bioinformatics and uh, and I'll venture to say even machine learning um, to to better get us to that map that we were dreaming about when you just step into the map yeah. and you can see the relationships. Yeah, of exactly. And logical yes, outcomes. Yeah, being able to multiplex different signaling pathways with different fluorophores, um, people starting to come to grips with modeling the kinetics of responses. Yes. Um, is fantastic. And I think that's where you know, being able to make use of the information we can now gather um, is going to be, yeah, is going to be big and, and, and very important, or is is big and important. Um, it is. I'm not sure why anyone does a, an endpoint assay at all anymore. Um, I, I'm not, I don't think a lot of, I hope that there are not a lot of people who do endpoint well, assays. Mm-hmm. I, I did some, and I'm guilty of that for my first. It was my first PhD paper, and actually, this question came. You know, someone in, in the committee asked me this question when I was defending my thesis, and I said, "Well, unfortunately, not only we didn't have the tools, but we didn't even think about it at the time that we should be looking at at a time course. What happens yeah. over time?" And, and see, so I think that's where. Well, so because I'd done electrophysiology for a long time, that's always a real time essay. Yeah, it's always because you you're. You know, you've got your living cell, and you're you're throwing your drug on and seeing what happens. And it's always, um, it's it's never an endpoint assay. And so that was always something that I, I sort of kept in mind, contrasting what we saw um, and then what people were seeing with the, with endpoint assays. There's still lots of people doing. Well, certainly in the papers I review, there's a lot of people doing endpoint assays. Um, for for cyclic AMP accumulation or or similar or or ERK and, and you think well when I put a drug when I put you know if I put uh, a cannabinoid a CB1 agonist on my cells I know that the response peaks in two minutes and it's desensitized after five perhaps not completely but significantly you're pre incubating for fifteen minutes then throwing your forskolin on and then measuring the cyclic AMP accumulation I mean yes you're measuring something but you can't, you know, what 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 are you measuring? What how, what what has happened? And how relevant is that? No, agreed. I think one of the most difficult things, well, I think we have the tools, we have, you know, the plate readers, you name it, to to look at drug effects on on cellular events in response to GBCR mm-hmm. activation. Re, I think in, in in a beautiful set of assays. I think what, what is lacking is the ability to integrate all those data points and to interrogate all those data points. Because you can run 30 plates in a day with, I don't know, X uh, number yeah. of dose response curves in time course, and you run your plate for an hour and you measure every, I don't know, two minutes. But if you don't have the tools to be able to look at differences between the different compounds, mm. then then it's I, I don't think a human eye can, you know, uh, Draw any conclusions where you're superimposing uh, fifty dose response curves times I don't know how many time points. Yeah, you've got to have some way of looking at well, what's the yes? You you need to have mathematical ways of yeah. of of modeling the modeling the time course and and having an under trying to understand what 
cellular process might be responsible for shaping that time course. Um, yeah, with most of the work in the last few years I've done has been in ATT20 cells, which express a G protein gated and inwardly rectifying potassium channel. Um, so pretty much any receptor you put in there will open that channel, cause the cells to hyperpolarize, which you can measure with a fluorescent dye. Mm-hmm. And that's been hugely valuable for us to be able to screen hundreds of compounds and, and look at the desensitization of signaling. But I don't know what mediates that desensitization of signaling. I don't, you know, it's possible, you know, we haven't really got good arrest and antagonists, but it doesn't seem to be correlated with arrest and recruitment or anything like that. It's don't, don't know what it is, um, but the signaling wanes nonetheless over the half an hour and different drugs do it differently. And, you know, some drugs like cannabinoid CB1 receptors desensitize homologously. They don't affect the signaling of, of other receptors. Whereas if you put an opioid receptor in there, it'll also block the signaling of somatostatin receptors you activate later on. Um, again, don't know why, be interesting to find out. But all that has to go into our model as well. You know, the crosstalk between between different receptors, which all supposedly share the same intracellular signaling pathways, but obviously they don't completely. Well, they'd all do exactly the same thing. Yeah, at least they, they share the same number of effectors available within the cell at that point. What um, can you tell us a little bit more about this? this these cells that you're using? You typically transfect your receptors in there, and then... so yeah, they're. I mean, they're they're one of my favorite cell lines because ATT twenty, at least supposedly. These are pituitary tumours from mice that were exposed to atomic test 20. So they're a, so they're sort of from poor old irradiated mice. We made um, Marina Santiago, who's doing her PhD in my lab, made a flip-in version of these cells. So we can pretty much pop any receptor into the same place in the cells pretty easily, just with a population-level transfection. Um, and so, yeah, we um, have flipped in opioid receptors, cannabinoid receptors, oxytocin receptors, whatever. Uh, and then we've largely, with ATT20s, looked at used this membrane potential assay because um, it's it's yeah, it can be done on ninety six well plate with a a flex station. It's mm-hmm. it's pretty rapid. You can sort of push the assay out to a few hours if you want to start looking at more sort of complex bio- biology you can you can run it out for a while um, it's robust and and and, and um, you know very reproducible um, unfortunately ATT 20s are relatively hard to transfect acutely so we haven't really been able to get for example a camiel plasmid in there to measure cyclic AMP very well um, you can't measure ERK in them because they have an unfeasibly high basal ERK activity um and so there yeah we can do one thing in those um but you know what you can do things you can do kinetics in there so you can look at allosteric um and look at you know look look at effects of allosteric ligands on activation inactivation potency all of that stuff which is very useful um and and something that you know we're continuing to do that's interesting. So you, you, these are mouse cells. Um, yep. Is there so you, you you can pop in any receptor, any human yeah. receptor? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are there any? Is there any crosstalk with uh, we, we endogenous receptors? So we look pretty carefully to see what they natively express. And Ken Mackey's group in Indiana, um, Brady Atwood did a paper where he sequenced. He did a whole genome. Well, he did. He used chips, but he compared hex cells and ATT twenties, and I think Cho cells and a and one other kind of cell line to give you a map of what it is they're expressing. Um, so you can look at that and see that okay, they don't have yeah, you know, they don't normally express mu receptors. Although actually, we've just sent our cells off for whole genome sequencing just to make sure what what it is they have. Um, usefully, they have some metastatin receptors, so there's an endogenous GIGO control. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't actually been able to get much 
much other sort of signaling out of them. They they don't seem to have very many other GIGO coupled receptors, um, which is sort of odd. But um, and so there is so there is crosstalk between mu receptors and the native somatostatin receptors, but there's not crosstalk between CB1 and the native somatostatin receptors. Um, That's great. That's good. That's a good thing because then you can screen with, with yeah. the CB1. Yeah, and I mean the 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 big advantage to these cells is this inwardly rectifying potassium channel. Um, they're the only cell line I know of that has GERC channels, and they're a you know a, na a natural readout for GIGO coupled receptors. Lots of them activate GERC channels in the brain and in the heart, um, so it's a sort of naturalistic um, signaling pathway. Um, yeah, it's like I said, it's robust. You can follow it out for as long as you like. Um, nice big signal window, so. It's got a lot going for it. That's great. I think I think the the paper that you mentioned. I think that's that's one of the papers that I always used to go back into whenever I started working on a new GPCR and I was looking at the list for hex cells. But yes. I think it's. I, I know the paper. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. I have it. I still have it somewhere. Yeah, but of course now we know that a hex cell is not a hex cell, and an ATT twenty is not an ATT twenty. So you really need to know what you know what's happening in, in the cells you've got in your lab. Yes. Um, which is why, you know, now, now that you can do whole genome sequencing relatively inexpensively, um, you can totally understand, you know, what's going on in your cells, which, you know, is, again, something that we all should be doing, one of the many things we all yes. should be doing um, yes. that co costs money and, and time and, and such. But Yes. Agreed. I think yeah, se sequencing and you know, doing doing whole genome sequencing, and also sequ now now it's even even less expensive. But at the time, you know, sequencing a plasmid, uh, fully sequencing yeah. a plasmid was a luxury, and now we can do it relatively quickly and yes. relatively inexpensively. And I think that's it's 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 you know like baking a cake and having the right tools and having the right ingredients in order yeah. to make sure that the that the results that you get make sense and then the, the conclusion that you draw out of those results is also yes. something yeah. reliable and hopefully reproducible, which I think is another another big question in science is reproducibility. Yeah. Yeah, and that starts by knowing what it is you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you can tell, tell other people, this is what I did. <laughs> yes, and then other people can, can replicate what you did with not only with your yeah. materials coming from your lab, but with, with the materials that we, they would be purchasing. Yep. Um, what would be your advice for, for junior scientists who would like to contribute to the field, either the GPCR field or the cannabinoid yep. field? Well, I think, you know, you. I'm sure everyone says this. Find something that you're really interested in. Believe in yourself that you can make a contribution because everyone on your podcast has started out in the same place, right? Yep. We've all started out as a high school student or an undergraduate, somehow either falling into research or being directed into research. Um, and I'm sure some people had great dreams of what they were going to achieve, but a lot of people are doing it because it's interesting and it, it turns out that, you know, most of us have got something that we can contribute um, something that we can bring to the study of, of G proteins or or biology or whatever. So believe that believe that there's a way that you can make a contribution, that you've got something to offer, and try and look for something that you're really interested in. And you know, get in touch with people, write letters. Yep. You know, if, if if there's something that you're really interested in. Go for it. Ask people, can I come and work with you? Um, and they, and you may not, you know, obviously not everyone's going to be able to say, yes, you can, but someone will. And you, you know, have an opportunity and, and grab it and run with it. Um, and, of course, always have an eye on where you're going to run because it might not necessarily be where you think you're headed. I mean, particularly these days, so few people can end up in the sort of fortunate position um, that I'm in, and so you know, be ready to to go where the journey takes you, whether it's into industry or um, into teaching or, or communicating science. 
um, you know, just be alive to the possibilities. Yeah, and I think I think that the, all of that starts with um, identifying what is it that you like as a person, what is the type of lifestyle that you want to have, um, what are the what what are the tasks that you like to do on a daily basis. Some people like to teach, to talk a lot. Some people prefer not to talk to anyone before I don't know noon because they need that time to to gather all that energy. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's one of the important things. Um, and I think you and I, you know, during the past hour, we've spoken about all of the things that remain to be un- uncovered and discovered in the mm-hmm. GPCR field. So there is plenty of space oh, for everyone to yeah. get into the field. And I the, love the, the idea of writing. Know. Sorry. Yeah, the more you know, the sorry, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Yes. The more yes. there's always new questions. There's always new questions. Yes. And I, I love the idea of writing letters. I think everyone writes emails and writing one email. Well, first of all, I think writing a hand sending a handwritten letter uh, would make such a great impact to 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 the to the person you're writing it to and you're asking to join their their lab. It would be a very nice differentiating factor. An email can easily get lost. An email yes. can easily get end up in a, in a junk uh, junk box. Uh, yes, <laughs> I know mine mine do sometimes. Yes, and I yours. love the idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but I love the idea of writing letters. So you know, pen, paper, mm. some some stamps, yep. and uh, be be sure to leave a phone number on on that letter for sure. Yeah, because not everyone's gonna not everyone's gonna have time to write back. I'm pretty but, sure uh, not. Yeah, that that is true. That is true. Which takes me to my next question. Um, what are the top three aha moments? as a scientist that you had in your career that, you know, shaped your trajectory? Yeah, I don't, I, I, know, I knew you were going to ask this um, and I've been sort of trying to think about, um, about what they might be. And, you know, I, I like to tell myself that I've sort of fallen into this life rather than necessarily being inspired by particular, particular things. Um, I guess one of the one of the important moments for the way I think about science and and do it was towards the end of my PhD, where, as I said, I've been trying to purify this endogenous ligand for uh, sigma receptors, and I'd discovered that zinc. So I was I was doing this in the hippocampus, and mossy fibers are full of zinc, and when we were stimulating those, they were releasing zinc which was displacing my ligand. And so that's, that's you know, I mean, that was new and, and sort of interesting, um, didn't know what it meant, but it was a little bit disappointing in the sense that, um, you know, it's zinc, right? It's something we, we knew about. And I think Charlie and I had dreams that there would be another in Keflin or something like that there. <laughs> and, and we were purifying, you know, I was, doing a lot of purification of brain tissue using HPLC and I was doing the appropriate parallel controls and, you know, the parallel controls with no brain tissue were always clean and the brain tissue always had this peak. And I finally purified this peak um, and Charlie took the tube off down to the mass spec down the corridor and he came back and it turned out that it was a plasticizing agent called DTG, ditoloylguanidine. And DTG was known to be a sigma ligand. It was, in fact, the radio ligand that we were using to, to track the receptor. And so after six to 12 months of, you know, resting on HPLC, what I'd managed to demonstrate was that brain tissue could accumulate a plasticizer. Um, <laughs> and, you know, reproducibly have this peak of activity. Uh, And so obviously that wasn't very interesting, but it it, it sort of, I don't know, I guess it showed me that no matter how careful you are, there's always potentially a surprise around the corner Um, and that, you know, you... You can't be disappointed by what you find because what you find is what you find and the data doesn't care about your feelings. No. <laughs> um, and, you know, nevertheless, I'd learned a lot 
by doing those experiments and by learning how to do HPLC and and all of that stuff, um, it was still, you know, I'd still had fun doing it, even though in the end it turned out, well, it was hardly a crushing disappointment, but in the end it turned out to be not very interesting. Um, but it also didn't affect, um, you know, it didn't affect my PhD. It's, I still, yeah, the PhD, I still wrote my thesis and defended it and it was all fine. So, you know, don't, it's, yeah, science is a process in many ways and um, you're going to have good days and bad days and things are going to work and things are not going to work. Um, but as long as you have ideas, you'll still be able to, you know, crack on with it. Um, yeah, I love, I, I, I love this story. I love this story because it has so such a good, um, it has a lot of lear lessons learned in it. You learned a lot of things. You also yeah. figured out something that may or may not change. Well, it didn't change your life. It didn't change that anything. <laughs> no. But now you know. You have an answer yeah. to that. And yeah, through right. that through that work, you, you gained confidence. Yeah. yeah. And you developed a scientific method to ask a question, and you got an answer. Wasn't exciting, but it's an answer. No, and it, it also, there was also another lesson there in the, the vagaries of science, um, you know, so pretty much, so Charlie, yeah, you know, was doing most of his work on endogenous opioids, mostly kappa agonists, um, kappa, you know, dynorphin and, and trying to measure um, dynorphin release in slices and, th and things like that. But the sigma had been hot and on the basis of the preliminary data we generated, he got an RO1 with some unbelievable score, like the best he'd ever got. And that was not that long before we discovered that, you know, discovered what I discovered, which essentially ended Sigma research in the lab because we both decided that really there wasn't much to see here. You know, we'd shown it wasn't a GPCR. Um, we'd shown that the supposed endogenous ligand was just something in the plastic. Um, so, and, you know, since then people have gone on to, to clone sigma receptors and and you know there's lots of people doing research on them in all sorts of different situations um but at the time we just sort of went yeah that's it even though he'd you know then for the next however many years had this fantastic grant um that he could use to you know chase chase opioids chase other opioids other fantastic um, projects Hopefully yeah, with better, yeah. more exciting yeah. outcomes. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, I, I don't, you know, there aren't any other, I, I can't really think of any other sort of moments of, of sort of particular inspiration or, or results that particularly made me mm -hmm. um, think about you know, things differently or fabulously yeah. or, or not fabulously or uh, or or whatever. Um, I think I think this example is is just fantastic because there are so many so many things to it. It's it's one simple example, but it it there is multiple ways where you can mm. you can interpret the events and then you can learn from those. Yeah. Yeah. All right. My last question to you yes. is: If you have job openings in your lab, where can people find you? Oh, I wish. Um, <laughs> so, or when you will have job me. openings? Yes, if I if if I have job openings, um, so people can people can always email me. So my so um, if they type me in, uh, and Mark Connor and Macquarie University, there'll be. They should be able to contact me that way. Um, you know, my email address is just my name at mq.edu.au. Um, they, you know, or jobs are advertised, university yeah. websites. Um, yeah, that's... They can write you a letter. They can write me a letter. Um, I think that that could be really awesome. You'll you'll I I I have one request. Just let me know if yeah. anyone writes you a letter. Yeah, I will. I will. <laughs> um, of course, I can't go into work now to look check my pigeonhole because we're but, locked um, down. Hopefully, well, it'll be a surprise if if you find a letter in your. Eh. 
in your mailbox. Well, I'm actually I'm waiting I'm actually waiting for my an updated authority to hold cannabinoids. So I'm kind of hoping there is a letter when I get back in. <laughs> so I can <laughs> keep doing what I'm doing. That's fantastic. I also wanted to mention that uh, once our podcast episode becomes available, you, uh, people can come on drgpcr.com slash podcast and they'll be able to um, click on, on, on the banner photo about this episode and we will display all the links uh, right. on, online yes. where people can yes. find you. Yep. And this way they'll get a chance to uh, write you a letter. I Anyone who's list, who will be listening to this podcast episode, please take a moment to write Mark yep. a letter. I think I, I love I love the idea of, of writing letters and we don't do it and it's not oh. just not fast enough. And I feel no. like even with emails, you write an email and if you don't get an answer within five minutes, you get anxious, but oh my God. Um, but I think I, I remember a time as when I was a teenager where I had, we had moved to Canada and I had a lot of friends in, in back in Romania and we used to write letters because there's no way you could pick up the phone and talk on the phone. It was so expensive. And we would, we would exchange letters once a month and it was like nine pages front and back yeah. because you yeah. needed to catch up on all of those, yeah. uh, all yeah. of those things. Those little, and those, hang on, I'm just going to, I think my. Hmm, my computer is not charging. Um, it's about to run out of power. But um, or even those blue aerograms. Remember the thin, the really, yep. really thin paper that you folded up and yep. and sent because they were so inexpensive. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. I remember uh, going to the post office, getting the stamps, and getting the uh, uh, the the little blue stickers to make sure yep. that it doesn't end up on a boat, but it ends up on yep. a plane. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. That was, yeah. And and getting a letter was so exciting. Yes. That, you know, yes. I, that was, that was fantastic. That was fabulous. I, lo- was, I love it. Yeah. I love it. I'll write you a letter, Mark. <laughs> by the time oh, you, <laughs> by the time you open up. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed our chat. Um, it was really a great pleasure having pleasure. you on the podcast. Thank you, Mark. It was a real pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Dr. GPCR podcast. I'd like to thank our guest, as well as our team members, Attila Foris, Shivani Sajdev, Ines Pinero, and Alexa Juran. We look forward to seeing you live at the next Dr. GPCR virtual cafe. Visit drgpcr.com slash virtual dash cafe for more information. Also, please subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter today. You can also find us on YouTube, and if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com slash testimonials. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. Also, email us with any questions and suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe. (laughs) 